Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick uh, remark that this is not the workshop 408 DNS enhancements and alternatives for future internet. Uh, we're not sure why it's displaying incorrectly, but this is workshop number 382, the future of digital identity and human rights. So if you are unsure about being in this room, we'll uh, give about two minutes or so, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Sorry, folks, we're just setting up the remote participation, so just give us a few more seconds to, to get started. We apologize. <laughs> 
So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, session. My name is Wafa bin Hassin, and I am the Middle East and North Africa Policy Council for an organization called Access Now. And we work on defending human rights in the digital age. Uh, we're having quite a bit of trouble <laughs> with the uh, remote participation, uh, but my colleague will be trying to work that out. And hopefully, uh, uh, one of the panelists will be joining us as soon as we figure that out. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so first I wanted to uh, introduce the speakers. So to my right is uh, Amba Kak. Uh, Amba Kak is the Global Policy Advisor at Mozilla and she has experience studying how regulation of technology and telecommunications work uh, works across both the European and Asian uh, contexts and geographies, particularly with respect to the open internet and digital rights such as privacy. She also provides experience around how public interest technology organizations and the web development industry are seeking to balance interests around digital identity and digital rights. Uh, moving to my left, Raman Jitsing Shima, who is Access Now's uh, Asia Director and a trustee at the Internet Freedom Foundation and Article 21 Foundation in India, has uh, expertise in digital identity debates, national privacy frameworks, technology product development, and corporate accountability, and he has a particular focus on Asia Pacific and emerging technology nations. He will share case studies as well as policy lessons from digital identity debates in Asia and discuss global policy do's and don'ts in digital identity policy design. Finally, to my left is Brett Solomon, who is the Access Now Executive Director and uh, has been guiding the organization's several arms for many years and will be sharing a more global perspective and international perspective on the design, implementation, and, uh, uh, and how we conceptualize digital identity programs around the world as well. So if we could just warmly welcome our participants. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, the, the colleague who will be joining us remotely, hopefully, is Usha Ramana Nashun. I'm sorry for pronouncing that wrong. Uh, she is an independent researcher and legal scholar in India. And uh, she is a noted academic expert and commentator on the subject of digital identity, biometrics, inclusion, and human rights. She has been a member of the Government of India's Committee of Experts on Privacy, which was chaired by Justice A.P. Shah, and actively engaged in legal and policy discussions around digital identity, biometrics, and evolving technology, uh, evolving technology on DNA in the context of rule of law and citizenship in India and the developing world generally. Um, we, and with her participation, which hopefully she will be joining, we aim to have her provide case studies from India and other common law nations across the global south on digital identity, as well as socio-legal commentary on how the reality of digital identity matches the legal and theoretical frameworks. So um, I guess huh, all of you are experts in the subject, and I'm very happy to have you here. But I think to get started, I just wanted to ask a very general question, and um, the way we'll do this uh, panel is just to kind of have a free flow of discussion and hopefully you all will join us later, but let's start here. What is digital identity according to you all? And I, I look forward to hearing from all of you on this. Thank you so much for that, Wafe. Um, I think it's an interesting question when you hear what is digital identity because it's often grounded based on where you're coming from. Digital identity can mean any form of identity online, and for engineers and for technologists, it's literally everything, right? From your login, say, on a social networking service, immediately Gaia, for example, on Google ID, Microsoft, Microsoft Passport, as some of you may be familiar, to more interoperable IDs, to people who come from either particular governments or traditions, it's often their national ID in a digital form, or different forms of identities online. Uh, if you ask that question of an uh, Indian citizen, for example, and the, the two of us here on this panel, um, the first thing that immediately comes to mind, and some of you might be familiar with that debate, is the Aadhaar project, which is the government of India's biometrically linked unique identity system, which is the world's largest now biometric linked ID program in the world. And that's a particular form of digital identity, but in a, in a sense, that's a particular national digital identity. And digital identity is a broader thing in itself. And I think the challenge often that sometimes is in the space is you have to unpack specific concerns and you have to engage with what is the top issue you might have to deal with. Um, why I mention that is that identity, you know, I mean, if you've seen the old overused comic strip, right, from the New York Times about nobody on the internet knows you're a dog, 
That's not true. You do know who the person is. But the conversation from the very beginning of the internet has been, do you link, say, identity information immediately to every form of login? And for a variety of reasons, sometimes, and engineers don't always agree with that today, it was not done so. But you still have identity in different ways. And increasingly, as you log in and create services, or you wish to authenticate, or you wish to use electronic signatures, that's a form of ID. But that's not, I think, what we're here to talk about. I think what we're here to talk about is the fact that, particularly over the last three years, there's been an increased focus on large identity ecosystems, sometimes identity stacks, or identity cards offline, which have become required for you sometimes to access services online, to things like, for example, Aadhaar, or even sometimes UK GovVerify, which are exploring the question about when does the state or a state-issued ID become critical for the services you use. And this is, again, a conversation that's really born out of your different experiences elsewhere. For example, for Malaysians and others, they've used ID, ID to access systems. Many of you here who are from the European Union are familiar with the EIDAS, which is the EU ID architecture regulation. Uh, but that's not necessarily been the most controversial issue. If you talk about digital identity for most people, it has actually been the Indian Aadhaar project because it's unprecedented. But B, it shows you a particular future that might be possible. It's a future where you will be required to provide your biometrics in order to be issued a unique identity. That unique identity will be required in order to access not just government services or citizenship rights. For example, even filing a police complaint at one point of time in the Republic of India required you to have this biometric ID. And it was this particular biometric ID. It wasn't, say, your passport or your local council or your city registration, it was this form of ID, to a place where the private sector pervasively uses it. For example, credit scoring agencies or airlines have, at points of time in India, required Aadhaar. This has been subject to a fairly controversial debate. Um, some of you may know that the project was started in 2009 subject to multiple uh, public uh, examples of debate and campaigning, eventually leading to the Indian Supreme Court he holding marathon hearings on the constitutionality of the project. And a few months ago, the Indian Supreme Court issued a ruling where it partly upheld the constitutionality of this project, but struck down multiple provisions as impacting rights, and said it, must con it can continue, but in an altered form. But what I wanted to give you is that identity, in many ways, is really what your governments can make it. And in the case of the Indian project, there are lessons about what to do and what not to do. The, what I'm trying to suggest to you is digital identity today can be a national system, or one pushed by governments or even pushed by intergovernmental agencies. It could be the completely private systems that we all use today. But it is a question that is going to your parliaments and national executives. That's at least, I think, the sense of where we come from on this. Thank you so much, Raman. Uh, Brett, did you want to follow up with that? Hi, I feel like I'm on Star Trek. Um, so hi, I'm Brett Solomon. I'm the Executive Director of Access Now. Thanks a lot uh, for having me. So it's really interesting to have this topic, um, the future of digital identity and human rights, because um, I think we need to understand digital identity in the context of human rights. And often, I think as Roman has kind of set out, is that digital identity has many different functions. And so the architects of digital identity programs aren't often thinking about um, human rights and yet the consequences on human rights are so significant so when you ask like what is digital what is digital identity i think that digital identity is the building block of the digital economy and the digital dig the building block of digital society and if we think about it and i think the title also has the future in it we're talking about the future, but we're obviously also talking about today because we've got a billion people on the Aadhaar database. I don't want to discount the benefits of digital identity. Like, <clears throat> I think for many people who are working in the development field, the concept of digital identity, the possibilities of digital identity are untold. You know, as I think many of us know, there's a billion people who don't currently have um, an identity, a legal identity, and there is a distinction between legal identity, of course, and digital identity. But there's a billion people who can't identify themselves, they can't open bank accounts, they can't cross borders, they can't as access ba basic social services. So the benefits of providing identity for those billion are very, very significant, and I think many people who are in this room who are working in the development space, working with refugees, the landless, the poor, etc., cetera, um, there's, there's great possibility. However, um, in all the years that we've been working on the interplay between human rights and new technology, I personally think that digital identity poses one of the greatest threats to human rights. And I'll say that again, I think that digital identity poses one of the gravest threats to human rights. It's not just because of digital identity itself, 
it's because of digital identity connected to all of the other emerging technologies that we're seeing. So for example, if you connect digital identity to the Internet of Things, to near perfect facial recognition, to the algorithm, to geolocation, just put all of those pieces together for a sec, if it's conceptually possible, you have essentially the building block of the totalitarian state. So you have the biometric connected to your geolocation, connected to the algorithm, um, <clears throat> connected to the Internet of Things. And it's not just about whether you're able to access basic social services that we're seeing today, but it's your very identity if we do future forecasts and say that digital identity is the building block of the digital economy and digital society. So I kind of want to issue a, a warning, in, not just in this conversation, but more broadly. Um, how do we think about, and I think in the conversation we'll talk more about the protections that are in place, but many of these digital identity programs are being established in the absence of the protections that would make a digital identity program safe, secure and user-centric. Um, and they relate to data protection, cyber security, proper governance, etc., which we can talk about later, but I just wanted to sort of have that as part of the initial framing because when we think about what is digital identity, we need to think immediately what are the consequences of digital identity. Absolutely. Thank you, Brett, for that. Uh, I wanted to also hear from Amba as well uh, on what is digital identity to you and what do you see as being the biggest, gravest threats? When we talk about threats to human rights, what are some of the threats? So if I can, since this is one of the few rooms that IGF small enough to do this, to poll the room, I'm just wondering how curious how many people in this room are already either you know, directly or peripherally working on digital ID in some form or the other? Okay, so that's it's good to know that um, still came to the session because it is, like Brett said, going to be, I think, more and more on the radar of anybody that's working on digital rights in any form. But the, the bigger reason that I ask this question is because as we speak, this, this panel is quite timely because as we speak, the global discourse on digital identity is being cultivated. Some might say that they've already cultivated the way it's going to look and others are pushing back to try and change uh, change what that discourse looks like. So I thought I'd give you a flavor of where it's headed and what I think some of the, the, the things we should be worried about. So the first, to, to answer your question about you know what is digital ID, is that often this question has become what is the best form of the of an ID system? So what some some people call it like what is good ID, other people say there are better and worse forms, but like what is that silver bullet that takes care of our privacy concerns? And already I think we make the mistake there because we assume that there's going to be a single digital ID system that is perfect. And, and I think that that's the biggest flaw because in fact we should always be talking about multiple ID systems and multiple choices offered to users. So for us, I think the starting point is to constantly push back and say yes, we need to have this conversation on what a good ID system should look like, but it should be multiple choices, multiple models. And, and that relates to a, a kind of second question which is where no matter what, what folks will tell you, indeed many folks in India might tell you that they've figured out the silver bullet, but clearly now the Supreme Court itself has disagreed with them. But there, there is no, the, the, I think the state of the art right now is that we need more research on two, to me, two broad buckets of questions. First, what are the technical choices um, involved in choosing a particular ID system, particularly when governments are considering it? What are the security and privacy implications of those technical choices? So that's one. And that relates, obviously, when I use the word privacy, I use it more broadly than just security. This is also speaking about autonomy, my right to remain anonymous, my right to live a life of dignity. So that kind of broad, what are the impact of these tech choices? And, and the second broad bucket is the policy choices. And again, I'm speaking most to mostly to government IDs, but maybe we ask the question of to what extent should a citizen be allowed to engage anonymously with the state? And, and, and that goes to the question of whether we take for granted that identifying oneself uh, is, is something that is the state's, identifying its citizens is the state's pr prerogative. So actually asking that question of, are there situations where we don't think that citizens uh, necessarily need to identify themselves? <laughs> And then maybe secondary, and this is something that has kind of blown up in India, which is... Excuse me, guys, sorry. That must be the acoustics in here, but we can all hear you. Thank you. So second part. So, so the, the first one is, you know, when, is, when if ever, is it uh, legitimate for citizens to engage with the state anonymously? 
Um, the second uh, policy choice which question which I think we should be asking is to what extent is it okay for the state to, man to make it mandatory to identify yourself using AID? Uh, like already I'm standing in the camp of, of possibly never, there should always be the choices. But I think these are the, the technical and the policy choices and if I had to sum up uh, what I said in the last five minutes is that this is the time to be having the conversation of what are the various ID choices that governments and private sector has, rather than assuming that that silver ball bullet has already been found, say, in India or, or elsewhere. So uh, thanks a lot, Amba. You raised an important part, uh, point about the various ID choices, but can you tell us more about like what choices could exist? Yeah, sure. So I'll give you some examples. Like, for example, let's say smart card versus unique identifier is one that was big in India. That would so there were a lot of privacy and security concerns raised vis-a-vis -vis Aadhaar. So many people asked, and, and many many people proposed that many of those concerns might be rectified if we had a, a smart card system. That it would give control back to the user and help them control the flow of personal data better than a unique identifier. And um, Usha Ramnathan is not there, but she has this uh, wonderful analogy where she says the important question is not, an, an ID system should not be one that identifies one, but which I, where, which I can use to assert my identity. And I, I don't know if I'm, I'm not saying it as well as she is, but, but the important point is do you assert your identity in a way that is empowering to you versus are you identified? And uh, I, not to sound techno-deterministic, but technology can shape that to a large degree and we need more research on, on what those, those tech choices are. So that's, that's the one example I can give, which is important. And then a second one which is more security focused is I mean, the, the oversimplification would be centralized databases versus decentralized databases, but this is a more complex. In India, we have, in some senses, it's decentralized across the states, but it's also centrally linked. And so what are the points of failure? Are they single? Are they multiple? And, and doing a kind of security audit is um, obviously another important one. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Raman very quickly to perhaps expand on the point that Amba just mentioned about uh, centralized versus decentralized databases as well as federated ID systems. And what does that mean really for human rights? Because some, sometimes the link is, isn't exactly clear. Um, perhaps you could kind of uh, guide us through that a little bit. And I think one of the challenges for the human rights community when it comes to federated ID or for the, or for the digital identity community itself is that it's a complex subject, right? And when you say bring complexity and human rights together, what you'll end up with is very long papers with very little sometimes understanding of what the basic question is. And I think with federated ID, it's very simple. It's a question about choice. What federated identity means is that you don't necessarily have one source of truth or one identity store that has everything. You have no one ID to rule them all. Instead, what you have is a recognition, a series of rules, either at the technical level or sometimes even at the legal level, that says here are the different forms of identity that say a government service, a department, a private sector entity, your ISP, your online e-commerce site will be willing to accept. We will check and confirm that it's valid and you give a choice to a person that you can form, use multiple forms of ID. Amba, for example, mentioned about smart cards and others that sometimes, for example, governments have worked on interoperable standards. That means no matter what form of ID you might have, when you present it, if it's a physical version of it, it's recognized. But also that you have no one treasure trove, one pot that everyone can target. There are multiple forms of it. I think that's a technical thing. And ultimately, I always give that caveat. I'm a lawyer. I like to do a little bit of coding, but I'm not an engineer. And engineers can explain this better. But as a lawyer, the one thing I can say to you, it is fundamentally about choice. It is about giving the person the choice to state whether they want to prove an, their identity in the first place. There may be legal limitations sometimes. For example, certain government, government buildings will always require you to provide ID. The UNESCO building is an example of that. In order to get in, we had to for, provide a form of identity. But also to sometimes say, I will choose multiple forms of identity, and I will make that available. And also to say that you don't trust any one engineering place as being perfect. And I think what Amba mentioned was very important. Everything can fail. So you want to make sure something that is robust, resilient, all these terms we hear in cybersecurity, and apply it in the digital identity perspective as well. And that's why federated identity is useful. You even have things like self-sovereign identity, which uses things not like just blockchain, which is often a buzzword, but blockchain is a critical part of self-sovereign identity, to say you can have identity wallets. You can actually have multiple different identity providers who are trusted, and so long as you use it, it can be accessed. These are abstract and may seem academic. I'm happy to engage with it later. I don't want to take more time. But there's actually a real choice available in terms of system design when it comes to identity. Thank you. And Brett, perhaps you could maybe 
further on that point, but what are some of the other policy recommendations yeah. that could help human rights, especially uh, when it comes to governance, data protection, uh, legislation, the legal landscape? Yeah. How can that all that be improved to allow for a successful digital ID program? So I wish we were having this conversation about four years ago <laughs> because um, unfortunately many of the kind of ingredients that would make the the kind of <clears throat> the setting rights respecting have not been put into place and they're also as I indicated like a little an anachronistic as well because we need to think about if digital identity is in fact the building block of the digital economy and society going forward then um, you know how do we make sure that that building block is both rights respecting and robust as Raman said and I think that issue of consent is absolutely central to all of this you know I've just I'm Australian I've just been in Australia and um, they, you know, the Australian government created my health record. Uh, are there any Australians here? Okay, well, if, you, if there were an Australian here, you would have had to opt out uh, of my health record framework by the 31st of October uh, in order to not be in the system, right? So it's sort of like a double negative. So essentially, if you didn't opt out, you're, you'd opt it in. And the consequences of your identity in your my health record, like it actually has not just like, your basic information about what you might or might not have purchased online or what or what service you've accessed, but the most sensitive data about you, you know, like how sick are you, how healthy are you, are you pregnant, do you have cancer, are you HIV positive, etc. So, so this issue of consent is central, but of course this whole database was created about four or five years ago and there was this massive public debate between uh, the health minister and the person who was running the, 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 the health database both arguing as to who could have access to that database. So that's really the second issue. It's not just about consent, it's also about access and designated access as well. Can law enforcement have access to that database? Um, can, um, you know, can your, your, your health practitioner, can your health practitioner share it with other health practitioners, et cetera? So, so there's the issue of consent, there's the issue of access, there's also the issue of withdrawing consent as well. What happens if your identity changes? Like obviously if you're a transgender person, it's a particular niche part of the community, but it's a part of the community. What happens if your identity changes? Does this, is the system sufficiently robust to enable that? I've kind of been using the hashtag, um, digital identity is hashtag everything forever, right? Hashtag everything forever. So, so you can change your password, but you can't change your biometrics. So what happens when your biometrics are hacked and your biometrics are your entry point to everything? All right, somebody takes your biometrics, it's your entry point, like in, on your phone, and many people have an iPhone, they've got facial recognition, bam, somebody takes your device or, uh, or takes the digital imprint of your face, they can open your phone without you being there. So, so I think we need to think about some of those issues, consent, access, um, removal of consent, um, but also, <coughs> Um, as Roman has touched on the issue of cybersecurity, you know, I think much of the discussion that's been happening here at IGF uh, and you know, with the Paris call at the Paris Peace Forum is about security, cybersecurity, and what kind of robust infrastructure is in place to ensure that this very, very essence of you uh, is protected and safe and secure. Because there's no such thing, well, there's no such thing as safety and security in cyberspace. So we need to think about that irreconcilable situation and that's why things like self-sovereign and federated systems are much better than having a single honeypot. Amba, um, did you want to add anything else to that before we move on to the next question? Yeah, when, apart from security, maybe just one more thing is that even for folks who aren't really involved in the digital ID debate, I'm sure many of you have been involved in data protection fights in your country. So I thought I'd just say a few things about where I think the conversation on data protection has intersected in India with digital ID, but, but more generally. So I think first, the, the first is issue is biometrics, because consent in some ways is again challenged by the idea of your, you know, you're walking through airports and you're your parts of your of your body and literally are, get, are being used to identify you. You may or may not know it. So I think that this is kind of digital ID brings brings that conversation up on passive data collection. And once again, how does an individual con individual control the flow of data that is leaving her? And and it's kind of that broader question. So I do think it'll help us think harder about consent. Um, then the second is obviously so. In India, there was a, obviously a debate like elsewhere in 
the, the tech clash was going on. The government seemed very keen, in a sense, to pass data protection law. But it was Aadhaar that allowed us to remind everybody that the state was, in fact, engaged in the largest data collection exercise in the country of sensitive personal data. So it brought us to the point that you cannot have a data protection law uh, which does not apply to the state, because the state is indeed, through ID projects, among its various other arms, going to be actively collecting data. And also, not just collecting data, but also being able to link discrete silos of data using, for example, IDs. So I think just the, the nature of the state as a data collection and data processing beast is changing because of digital ID, making it amply clear that you cannot have a data protection law that does not uh, fully apply to the state as well. Um, so yeah, yeah I'll, I'll end with that. Yeah, of course. Go ahead. I, I, I'm of course also just going to pitch something. So we 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 actually were, we've been fascinated by this debate at Access. So we actually got together and with the help of many other people, and so all 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 faults are ours, but all insights are from other people. We we actually published a, a policy recommendation a guidebook on digital identity a few months ago. The final version of this was published at RightsCon Toronto. We are always in the process of updating this. We plan to do more. This was about national digital identity projects. And those of you who want a copy, just grab me right after this. I'll make sure you have an email version. I have a few limited hard copies as well. And if you have criticisms or ideas, we love that. But what I want to give you is not the specific cybersecurity or privacy recommendations. It's a more important one. And I have worked in the tech sector. My previous job was in Google. And you know, the favorite of the tech sector is to say, move fast and break things. On identity, my recommendation is do not move fast and break things, because it's actually critical to it undermines trust in a way that you cannot imagine. And I often say the Indian Aadhaar debate, for example, or even the UK ID card system, the Australian ID card project, many others as well, look at the political controversy it triggered, look at the loss of trust it created in systems, but more importantly, see sometimes that they're actually critical moments to reboot things. Uh, in the case of identity systems, you cannot <coughs> patch them later, actually. If a systemic flaw is there, it is there forever. And identity is actually at the core of everything we do, right? We identify ourselves in different ways at different places every day. So that's critical. The other one, just to remember, is sometimes it requires massive institutional you know, rethink. And the other example to that is, some of you know, the French data protection regulator, Canil, is right across the, the street. Canil was set up because of a large identity tracking project in France which led to a massive realization that you require a standing regulator on this subject. So what I often encourage people, including those who are trying to create good ID, is actually sometimes wait. It might be slow, but it's worth having consensus in this space, because a broken ID system actually kills it for everyone. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I just want to make one point, because we've been talking a lot about the citizen and the state. There's actually another player in here, which is the private sector. So multiply all of these things, what we've been talking about, and add it to somebody owns your biometrics, and it's a company. Um, so I don't want to be too dystopian about it, but the reality is is that all of these sectors, it doesn't matter whether it's the insurance sector, the travel industry, the banking industry, like there's task forces in all of these sectors. There's task force forces in all of these companies. Uh, and they're currently building this out because they recognize that as I say, it's the building block of the digital economy, and that's why part of the reason why India has built the stack as well, the demonetization process, etc. It's a recognition that like this is where the economy is going to grow. This is how you're going to buy, sell, live, be, travel, etc. So, the internet, of, the internet of identities. The internet of identities. Is that a new term? New term. It's a new term. <laughs> <laughs> the internet of identities. Um, so, um, so what do we do? in the context of the state which has the obligation to you know protect and defend human rights you know we obviously have the guiding principles but what does it mean when companies are building this stuff out industry bodies are building this stuff out and yet not only don't aren't necessarily subject to data protection frameworks but aren't even thinking about this like they're not thinking about it at all i've spoken to them i'm like what about and they're like hmm that's kind of interesting i was like well that's going to impact 50 million identities <laughs> So you better start thinking about it. Absolutely, and to follow from that actually, so the conversations have evolved, evolved since four years ago or so, which is, you said, we should have been having this conversation long ago, but with the landscape of digital identity becoming more and more sophisticated and more and more developed, what is this community of human rights advocates, uh, 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 tech development experts, what does this community need when it comes to the future of digital identity? And I want to ask each of you this question actually. So what in reality, pragmatically, practically, what do we need to see happen? 
And if you could limit your responses to maybe two minutes max, so we can take questions from the audience as well, so we can uh, close on this note. So I think the conversation needs a lot of things, but I'll just I'll give you a personal anecdote which I think gets to it, which is, so I work for Mozilla in India, and about like two years ago, the Mozilla, as you know, is a community of technologists, and many of them are volunteers who contribute code and such like. So they got in touch with us, and their question was this. They said that there's a lot of talk of open source ID, particularly, f you know, uh, folks within the government and the Aadhaar project claiming that this is an open project. And so they said, do, not, do you not think that like Mozilla should come and clarify what open actually means and what openness really means? And uh, that was a, a, an interesting opportunity because you actually had technologists coming in to say that we do need to prevent, of course it is important to have open whenever these tech stacks are made, they should be open, but there should be a technical community that is able to challenge and prevent what uh, I think is now called open washing. And just to take it one level up, I think it's also very important in this debate because lawyers like me will always often make the point, but we need the support of technologists that are actually evaluating these systems and ev evaluating the technical claims because you don't want to be in a situation as India was where you have uh, many about to retire Supreme Court judges looking at a highly technical project, looking at highly technical claims and feeling completely ill-equipped to actually understand them and therefore to make a reasoned decision. So they'd rather say, well, the government is telling us it's secure, so I guess we should believe them. And so we don't, I mean, we were, we were already in that situation, but it should not reach to that point anywhere else. And I think the the answer is that we, we start as, as the human rights community, as uh, people working on digital rights, talk to technologists right from now. Like Brett said, this should have happened five years ago, but uh, it's not too late to start now. Brett, Roman? Well, I would just, we've talked about data protection a little bit. I think that many of us are operating, <coughs> in, living and operating in countries which do have some form of data protection framework, but again, back to Australia, like there is no, there's no constitutional right to privacy. Um, so, and I think similarly in India, we've seen what's happened in courts where they've actually identified that there is a constitutional right to privacy via the Adha. So it was almost like, um, you know, it should have happened the other way around. But, but, but the issue around privacy, um, if there isn't frameworks of, around privacy, then what is the redress? You know, what are the sort of rules of the road that these systems are being created in, and how do citizens remain confident that the state is actually protecting that data? Uh, this is personally identifiable information, as we, you know, as we've um, identified, so as we've mentioned. So, having data protection frameworks in place, um, with you know, a data protection authority that's able to um, um, follow best practice. Uh, and there's many examples of best practice or getting to be best practice. We've seen the, data, the, the GDPR in, in the European context, what data protection can look like. Um, obviously, it's, it's you know, not perfect, but in the absence, the creation of digital identity in the absence of a data protection framework is a recipe for disaster. So it's like that's step one and then that's step two. So I think as civil society organisations, as governments, as regulators, whoever is here in the room, like that's the first, one of the first questions that we should be asking. I completely agree, Brett. Thank you for that. Raman? I, I think, though, and I see a hand go up, so I, I think we're getting a queue of questions. So I was going to, like, not, I'll, I won't keep you too long for that. I think the one question to sometimes ask all of us, ask ourselves is, what identity for? Like, why are you collecting identity? It's the data protection question, right? Why are you collecting data for what purpose? And sometimes that's really a challenging conversation to have. And, I, you know, I would advise engineers and product managers, sometimes it's super hard just to say, look, why are you collecting the data? And because they say, like, sometimes there's unforeseen benefits or values of collecting data. That's a challenge. And that's a question sometimes you've had to, I think, particularly in the emerging world, and perhaps sometimes particularly outside of cultures or outside of nation nations where data protection regimes have been implemented for 20, 30, 40 years, there's a question on why do you need my ID? My favorite question being, for example, when I've gone to, uh, you know, buy a, a packet of toothpaste, do you really need my name and address? No, right? And I ask them, think, why? And that's a question that you have to particularly remember, and I think the ID community forgets, is that this is really something that is global, and which means that you assume, for example, you have the same existing courts, the same sorts of DPAs that you might have in Europe or parts of North Africa or elsewhere, but actually, no, that's not always the case. And you also don't often have technologists and others who recognize these sorts of issues. I do think it requires an honest, direct conversation with people on what is identity for. I would leave one question is sometimes that really, if you're building an internet of identities, 
be careful about why you're doing so, and really think about the people who are being left out. I, Usha couldn't join us because of technical issues right now, but the one thing I'll channel for her, she's often asked is, think of the people who are excluded. That 2% who might not be able to access a system is somebody who needs food rations at a critical moment, somebody who has died because they can't access something critically, somebody who could not be able to access their family member due to perhaps an immigration issue, somebody who's being profiled and being tracked and perhaps being subject to police or law enforcement violence, not just in the developing world, but in the developed world, because we've created an ID system that says identities are perfect, clear, and what you access in your dashboard means everything. In fact, what I sometimes warn people is that it's not about rights. It's about challenging what you're building a dashboard for, what you're collecting things for. So we need that sort of honest conversation, not being acrimonious, but sometimes just being honest with each other on why we're building certain things and for what purpose. I agree with that. Thank you to Brett, Raman, and uh, Amba. Uh, I would like to open up the floor for questions. So if any of you, uh, great, there's a lot of hands. So I guess I'll start over here, and then I'll, I'll go to the right slowly. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Lori Shulman from the International Trademark Association. And I have a question because I am not a technologist. I have been a tech lawyer in, in the past, but I am not a, a coder or a programmer. So when it comes to these questions about digital identity, are you simply talking about literally assigning a number to anybody? Are you talking about data sets, unique data sets, what they might look like? I, I'm, I'm actually not clear when you talk about digital identity how far we're going because, uh, I mean, from a United States perspective, I have a social security number. I have a driver's license. When we found out that social security numbers are easily hacked, then, then US states started issuing separate numbers on driver's license. And I'm kind of wondering, is it, is it as basic as some sort of universal digital code, or is it something else? Thank you so much. So we'll take maybe three more questions and then come back to the participants for a round of answers. Uh, so uh, I would like to go over here, then over there, then over there. Hello, um, I'm Francois Modilian from Paris. Um, I heard the, the, the word threats, but could you uh, clearly name the threats? Recently, there was an interview with a French intellectual, and he was using the, a new expression I've, I, never, I never heard before, uh, techno-liberalism. Is this what you meant or not? Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, over here. Hi, my name is, is John from the I.O. Foundation. Um, just one first comment um, extending what Brett was mentioning, that it's not so much only about the fact uh, that there's this obligation to, to, to uh, provide a digital ID, because we are already facing that, as Raman was mentioning, about you know, going to a place, having to ID yourself. It's the fact that the consequences of no one doing so are um, very dire, and they are just automated in a very easy way at very a cost zero. And so coming around and not presenting that is just, just a physical impossibility. So for instance, if I don't present my ID, I just don't enter the, the, the room. Or if I can't uh, you know, get some services, I can always try to find, figure out a way around to, to get to those same things. But the moment that you can actually control those digital IDs, uh, is basically uh, enforcing those restrictions is basically cause zero for that particular organization or, or, or government, which is what I see as, as the, the complication here. Now, my question is, um, I get two of them very quick. Um, how do you guys, how the panel feel uh, about the Chinese social credit system that has been so interestingly imposed and somehow embraced by Mr. Macron yesterday? Um, and, uh, and beyond the fact that a group of, a bunch of people who just get together cannot build a road, so they can't really have a structure of a government and all the services the government can provide. How do you guys see the evolving uh, the evolution of the DAOs as, as they are right now in, in the space of the scene? Thank you. Okay, so one final question. I believe it was right to my left. There you go. Hi, um, my name is Catherine Evans and I'm a researcher in philosophy at Sorbonne University. Um, I wanted to talk a bit with you about the relationship between digital identity and the Internet of Things, all of this sharing of interesting data that could maybe help machines work better in terms of efficiency, especially the more we know about someone, the better decision we can make, that sort of reasoning. I wonder if you have any practical examples of the kinds of things that have been envisaged and the kinds of things that are threatening, and then again, how it this, this builds this totalitarian risk that we were talking about. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. So uh, we'll start with Brett. Go ahead and answer that question, and then we could take a round of answers and uh, hopefully go to remote questions. And if uh, folks want to do a second round of questions as well, thank you. Yeah. So, so on your point related to like what are we actually collecting here? I think we need to think about it um, in its kind of worst case scenario as a as biometrics. I think when we think about it in the context of facial recognition, um, your iris, your breath, your gait, uh, and the technology that can also be used to, um, to, to, to like, the distance um, that new technologies can kind of um, jump, so from the, the sensor to the individual can be a face in a crowd of a thousand people at 60 feet, right? I mean, don't quote me on those figures, but the point being is the technology is advancing to such an extent that you can be identified and, got, and tracked back to the database uh, so that, you know, basically what happens is that your biometrics is geolocated, your facial recognition or whatever it is, um, is near perfect. The connection of you, your identity to whatever thing is now in, whatever chip is now in your body is also connected to the screen, to the table, to whatever it might be. So you've got this internet of thing where every single piece of, um, every device, including the human body, is also connected to the internet of things. So kind of creating this sense of um, inescapability. And we talked about issues of anonymity. Anonymity, to our mind, is essential to a democracy. Um, we talked about issues of consent lack of consent and therefore on the grid without the ability to log off. I think we also, a lot of us as organisations, we've talked about, you know, the sort of the right to access or the right to connect. We need to now think about the right to disconnect as well and what does that mean in the digital environment. Um, so um, these are some, I don't know exactly the term on techno-liberalism and sorry I didn't hear the interview, but the threat that I see is that um, that individual agency will become a thing of the past, is that the individual will be so connected, um, so inex inescapably connected, so inescapably located, that in the absence of all of the things that we've been talking about, like data protection, proper governance, technical standards, etc., that um, we become part of the totalitarian system and that those who have control, and sorry to be dystopian about it, and I haven't read any sci-fis on this, but I'm sure that there are sci-fis on this, uh, is that the state will have total control and it will be a relationship between the state and the private sector. Now, some good news. <laughs> so I keep saying, if you're, if you're interested, I think you should watch Gattaca, because I think it goes to the question you posed about what is digital ID, what is in it. The basic thing is it's at least a unique number, it's some, or at least it's an identifier. For most systems that we're concerned by, I think the reality is that it's not just a unique number, it is linked to biometrics, it's linked to demographic information, your name, address, where you might be, your father, mother's name, but much more. And the problem, I think, with most digital ID systems, and this really varies, and I think one challenge is that the US social security number is so pervasive in the minds of the Western world, the reality is it's actually a very regulated system in its own ways, and most other governments are adding much more information, rich information about travel, what you're doing, all sorts of information. My, my, my best example of that is when the Indian f finance minister was asked on the floor of the Indian parliament, what information might you link about this in the future? Would you link DNA? He said, yes, honorable member, it may be linked. I don't discount that possibility. The government fully sees the technological developments and we will see. And this is not abstract. There is now a proposal for a DNA database and a discussion sometimes saying, should we link it to ID? So the challenge I think today is we have to ask our governments, what are they linking? We don't always know this. And I just think the couple of quick points there. Technoliberalism, I think one reality is technoliberalism liberalism in the context of ID has sometimes been said, if you have an ID number, you have a dashboard, everything will work. You don't need the government always there. You don't need you know, government services you know, to make the market work better. And I think one of the challenges with ID actually is it also connects to this larger conversation that dashboards and reduced governmental role in service delivery will fix everything. And I'm not an expert in that, but I think that's a challenge to encounter. The, the problem that you identified is very important. It is you cannot avoid 
the automated consequences of your decision. In fact, what is normally your right becomes what we call an exception. And this is not language I come up with. For example, in the Government of India's handbook on the Aadhaar system, it is an exception an operator must do. And if you talk to any young government, they hate giving exceptions because you give an exception, you're accountable for it, right? So that's not something that's easy. So it actually what are your rights become these sort of rare exceptions. And I think the challenge that you said is the Chinese social credit system linked to that is not just about the government. The thing in digital ID that's most sometimes troubling to me is the fact that it's an entire set of private ecosystem players who want to provide services. And they're saying, because we don't have enough data about you, we can't give you really the services you want. Even if you don't want them right now, we want to come up with it. And I think the challenge is that it's connected exactly to what you said about if we know more about you, we could be better. The problem is that it's an addiction. And the likely let's talk about it that Silicon Valley, and not just Silicon Valley, all Silicon Valleys globally have become addicted to the idea that if you have more data about you, we'll come up with a fantastic solution. There's actually, you know, d point of diminishing returns. But more importantly, it's about the sort of societies we want it to be. I don't want a hyper -tailorized, tailored, customized society where government chooses to give me different services just because of the data they have on me. There are certain times when you have to say, no, this is enough, no more. And I think that's when challenge with ID is that it becomes even more linked to the idea of data obsession. I think they've, they've set out, uh, I agree with everything Raman just said. I just want to add one thing, which is on uh, the next time you hear of an ID proposal, you'll often find that it might seem harmless because it might, for example, like in India, take very little data, or it might have kind of restricted purposes. But I think what's important to question at that stage is has it already become, or is it pushed as a kind of infrastructure? Could that could then be applied to future users. So it could be DNA, tomorrow it could be criminal process, it could be, you know, I mean, the list is endless. So I think this is one area where I would encourage us to think of dystopian situations because it is created in a way to be used in, is a, as an infrastructure for multiple purposes. There could be good purposes and bad purposes and then we're left to our own political process and indeed the politics of our own countries to fight for that. But I think if we can, by design, uh, I guess by default prevent certain uses, then that, that would be a good place to end up. Thank you so much. Uh, I did want to add that uh, national, national digital identity programs are, are popping up everywhere. I mean, the two speakers that we have to my left and to my right are both from India, and Brett is guiding a global uh, policy program. But the, the, I mean, I'm from Tunisia, and I worked on digital ID as well. And there was an attempt at having a national digital identity program. And all of these gaps that my fellow speakers spoke about have existed in in national legislation that was attempted, um, that attempted passage in parliament. And so, and uh, we see it also with not just national digital identity cards, but also with public service cards uh, or um, other types of forms of, of, of identity. And so there is a lot of diversity and, and variance when it comes to geography as well as um, types. So this is very much the tip of the iceberg. This conversation, I think we're touching on a lot of really important topics. But I think every single thing we talked about could be talked about for about a day's workshop. So um, that being said, I will open it up for a second round of questions. But I did want to ask first, are there any remote questions? I don't know who's managing that. No? Wonderful. Uh, so I, I don't mean wonderful that we don't have remote participants, but, <laughs> but we have 10 more minutes. So please go ahead, and I will look at the, the, the other uh, participants soon as well. Thank you. Okay, Klaus Stoll, the Prokus Group. I wonder if you, uh, I heard only one key word which always has to go with identity only once mentioned here, and that's basically citizenship. We are citizens of a country and we have a digital citizenship, and a lot of these questions you are asking, at least a lot of these things, can, uh, are caused and are the, uh, by that we have not sufficiently defined the rights and duties of our digital citizenship and the relationship between these duties. And I think, for example, uh, a lot of questions for data, if we, st it, we, we can use the same technology but if we keep the data of our different citizenships separated, we solve a lot of these, uh, uh, these problems. So uh, don't you think that we should, when we talk about security, identity, and things like that, go a, little, a few steps back and help to establish our digital citizenship and define the rights and duties? Because everything which comes afterwards will be made much, much easier. <laughs> 
Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the, the digital identification systems are marketed or promoted uh, on a number of uh, arguments, you know, improves efficiency, enhances security, uh, reduces public uh, expenditure waste and corruption, uh, and so on. And uh, there is also a nexus between the public bureaucracy and members of the tech community uh, working together promoting these mega, mega systems. Our counter arguments haven't been too powerful or strong enough in my, my view. The human rights arguments are there, but when it comes to all these other utility related arguments, uh, how do we, how do we increase the, the power of argument on the side of human rights concerns? Uh, it's an open question to all um, uh, panel members because uh, when, when I was discussing the other program, for example, with a, with a uh, activist friend from India, he was actually supportive of it and he said, you can't make omelets without breaking a few eggs. Now, how do you counter that sort of mindset? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Dragana. I'm the executive director of Localization Lab. Um, my question is, what sort of threats does digital ID pose to refugees and, and especially un undocumented migrants? These are vulnerable communities whose opinion no one seeks about how they feel about the, ta the, the data taken, where there's oftentimes very little informed consent about what your rights are, where this information is stored, and who is shared with. Thank you, Dragana. And we have two final questions, and I will close it after them. So please go ahead, and then, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Greg, and I wanted to, first of all, thank you all for your question, the panel and the members of the public. Uh, um, the one I wanted to ask was, uh, is it too late for like anybody or me to protect my identity from uh, uh, the other, other people? Uh, recently, uh, you might have heard about the United States finding uh, opening cold cases and finding killers uh, years uh, after the facts, thanks to the DNA that had been uploaded by uh, members of their extended family on genetic uh, databases. Uh, but uh, so that might seem like a good thing and uh, still a bit too futuristic for us to wrap our hands around. But uh, the any uh, website with enough data can infer so much about us. Uh, with just a few clicks, uh, psychometrics, Cambridge Analytica, <laughs> so many things to uh, wonder, isn't it too late for uh, us to have uh, like protected identities? <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm Ivan from uh, Marketing Manager Access uh, Partnership, different access. Uh, so we... Yeah. <laughs> uh, so how do you see, uh, do you see some kind of form of a, let's say, digital ID, light version of digital ID, which, for example, doesn't necessarily have all your biometric information, but gives you the opportunity to keep all your subscriptions into one place and to be able to give consent and reclaim consent back when you want, whenever you want, into like a single type of place? Uh, because, uh, yeah, recently I s heard someone speaking that's kind of the future of... Uh, data uh, claim, data consent. Thank you. So I'll leave the, the floor to the speakers before. And uh, when you're done with answering the question, if you'd like to just say a few closing words as well, so we can wrap up. The floor is open, so. Yeah, yeah I just had one thought on the uh, on undocumented migrants uh, question. I'm not an expert on this, but I just thought I'd share Two things. The first is there. So interestingly, like for example, the government ID in India was afforded to residents and not citizens. So to your point, uh, that was the distinction it made. And in fact, one of the criticisms that was not from the digital rights community was that this was giving an ID to people, kind of blurring the lines between who was a citizen and who wasn't. So that's one. The second is just, and therefore the link to assume that there is a link between a national ID and and citizenship is not always the case. Uh, but second, I've been hearing a lot of private 
sector consortia and other other voices from the private sector speaking about uh, this idea of global citizenship which sounds like yet another buzzword but it, it's it's this kind of fascinating idea that rather than governments giving people identi identities, there should be a way to for to have a, a identity and a citizenship that's untethered to governments, which sounds like, to some people, it sounds like the kind of utopia that they dreamt of, the anarchic utopia. But I think it, to me, it brought up a prior question is, you can give someone an ID, but the rights that they are entitled to as a result of having that ID will still depend on their governments and on their rights, on their entitlements, and on the politics of their countries. So I would just urge people not to buy the argument that, like in India, you give people IDs, therefore you give them food. There is still that leap to be made, and the people will still be dealing with realities on the ground and fighting for those things, depending on who they are in society. So, yeah. uh, I thought I'd address the quick thing about on marketing and a few others, but on ID systems and marketing them, right? The marketing, the opposition. I think one challenge really is besides the human rights implications, which are significant, and I don't want to undersell that. But let's just talk about efficiency. Most centralized ID systems are, to put it bluntly, incredibly bad and inefficient and expensive unless they're designed well. It's like a big infrastructure project, right? Any massive infrastructure project or standardization project has chooses certain winners and losers and can be inefficient if not done properly. I think our challenge is sometimes also a democratic one. How do you tell people that, look, it's limited government and sometimes you want multiple forms of power, and in this case, multiple forms of ID. It's how you argue for federal systems, right? Most, most of the time, most people in national capitals, to put it bluntly, hate federal systems. Because why do you want to share power with, say, a state capital or someone else? But the reality here is you want plural efficient systems because partly that efficiency and that trying to use market terminology, this competition across IDs is also a good thing. But it's a challenge there. I think, you know, and just on refugees, actually the ICRC, the International Committee for the Red Cross and Red Crescent has done great work on this, and I've heard, them, heard this from them and many others, that actually refugees are a great example, even undocumented migrants of people, where ID is empowering, but that ID may not be something they always want. They may want it for the period when they're stateless, but they do not want it after that. They want it to be restricted, and they want to know who has access to it. And most, for example, immediate groups in this space, I think, restrict the sort of data who accesses it. And in the UN system, I know there's a conversation in the statelessness agenda. I encourage you all to speak to officials in the UNDP and others. We are, and we've been engaging with them on what is the UN's recommendations on the issue of legal identity. So that's a situation where I think the floor is open and we need to engage. And I think, uh, I just want to address your point, is a light form of digital ID possible? Yes, I think there are multiple forms of it. I think centralized biometric ID is tough because there's always metadata who logged into the system and when, and that's hard. I think there are self-sovereign wallet modes to ID, which are existing. There's even the idea sometimes that, you know, uh, you want not to have a centralized ID system, but you want a centralized authenticator, what the UK is doing with GovVerify, right? That they say we will accept multiple forms of ID, we're just saying we bet which ID is okay or not. And the last question, I think you said, like, is it too late? I don't think it's too late. But I think the question, really, on identity as well as on data protection is how much pressure we bring to our elected representatives, those in government, those in intergovernmental institutions about putting limits and restrictions. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a policy person, so obviously I would say this, but really we need to campaign, mobilize, and channel this as a movement to people saying put restrictions on what's happening on identity. For example, when you're talking about DNA, put restrictions and questions about how you use it. The Innocence Project, which in the United States triggered this entire movement about looking at DNA to f free people, they say DNA is not the best form of evidence to convict people. It can be good to sometimes acquit them, but not for conviction. And they said we are going and telling law enforcement officials this, so it's actually there in statute. So they're saying we're not just going to say this, we will lobby to get it in law. So I think we need to do more communication outside this room to our elected lawmakers. Um, I'm really glad you picked up the question of refugees and displaced persons because um, <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not sure how many of you followed the, the dreamers in the US, basically the 800,000 uh, kids who came to America with their parents and Obama basically issued an executive order and said, come all ye you know, um, dreamers and I will give you a social security number and I'll also give you the capacity to work. All right, 800,000 people joined the database and Trump came along and was like, thank you very much. I now have the identity and the biometrics of all 800,000 of you. And it's just a way in which to understand the fragility of refugees, asylum seekers, displaced people, and also to future forecast as well, to think about when these things are being created what do we know of the consequences later down the track? 
Um, so I won't try and address all of the questions, but I think this idea about how do we, as this generation, with if it is hashtag everything forever, how do we actually create the infrastructure, the policies, the practices, so that future generations aren't part of that dystopian future, but are actually able to have control over their own data and their identity to be able to benefit from the systems, from basic social services to content access to you know, healthcare to travel across borders and within borders. And I think that's the challenge that we have. Great, so that brings us to the close of our session. Um, uh, Brett, to echo what you thought, I think we should just continue to think about what our future generations will have to deal with, especially when it comes to merging digital identity with other technologies like machine learning, big data. You know, we think of these things as uh, terms that are being thrown around, but eventually they're all going to interact with one another. Um, so thank you all so much for coming, and thanks to our participants especially, and uh, wishing you a good rest of your day.